good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Valida Repanac I'm an associate professor uh, at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Sarajevo. It is my pleasure to moderate uh, today's third uh, thematic panel on social movements, uh, mobilization and democracy. Uh, we will have uh, five uh, panelists. There is a slight change uh, in, in the schedule. Um, I will introduce, uh, firstly, Benjamin Yu from UK, an independent uh, researcher. Uh, Benjamin uh, has, to, uh, has, uh, uh, has to leave uh, yeah, immediately yeah, yeah. after his presentation, so I will shortly open, open the, the floor for your questions uh, after uh, Benjamin's presentation, and then we will proceed with uh, Boyan and uh, other panelists. And of course, at the end, we will have we have a lot of time. We will have a discussion. Um, so, uh, Benjamin, uh, your title is uh, Art for Democracies, Revitalizing Democracy, Traveling Theater, Social Movement, Group Innovations. Please, the floor is yours. So, good morning everyone, um, apologies to, to record this change um, to, uh, to the schedule. What happened was, the, the plane from Manchester to Frankfurt was so late, it made me miss the scheduled flight to Belgrade at the weekend, so I had to fly over the next day on Sunday. Uh, that flight was also delayed, so I didn't get to my hotel till about 3.15 yesterday afternoon, uh, what, Sunday. All the time I intended to put into linear presentation disappeared on Saturday and Sunday. This means that I'm having to read from my presentation notes, which I've written. So that's I'm just reading from my notes. Please can say thank you to the University of Belgrade Philosophy and Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory Department and the organisers of this wonderful event. Uh, clearly this conference book will advance learning on the political effects of travelling art and theatre social movements in autocratic regimes. Good. My presentation will be in five parts. My presentation begins with the brief history of travelling innovative uh, art tools. In section one, I give a brief overview of some of the history of travelling arts and theatre groups who had a political message. I discuss how they were treated and how sometimes they have been conspired against, persecuted, especially in autocratic states. The harassment and persecution were due to their political messages. For example, the Andalay brothers' uh, vendetta in the 1950s. Section two is called Travelling Theatre Innovative Art Social Movement Group Activities. In part two, I discuss how arts based social movements throughout history have provided a critical lens from society to their contemporary audiences. Part three of my presentation is called Digital Political Activists Change the World by Telling the World. In section three, I briefly discuss a rigid based case study. Part four of my presentation is called Community Radio Stations and Many Other Arts and Theatre Innovations. In part four, I discuss community radio and how this region can give travelling arts to activists of artivists and other performance artists with the message and media presence a voice. Part 5 concludes my presentation, providing a brief, a brief overview of what the vision from contextual analysis of my digital review. The main political finding is that performing artists are much, are, are much more effective because they are open to their critique of their national government. This slide provides a visual impression of autocracy by an answer from 1905. Autocracy is when absolute power in the country is in the hands of very few people, or even just one person. The picture is from Puck, a satirical social conscious magazine, which was in publication from 1871 to 1918. This picture depicts a disease-ridden disease skeleton type figure dressed in a shawl, drawing the king's attention by tapping him on the shoulder. At the bottom picture are several pairs of, pairs of hands of, of people, clearly pleading, asking for help. This book cartoon communicates that the people are faceless, powerless, for virtue of existence. They are non-people whose identity the audience ever gets to know. The king in this picture representation of autocracy is a, is a Russian king, Nicholas II. The disease written skeleton, while stepping uh, on the king's shoulder with one hand, is pointing at the picture of, of the guillotine with the other. Uh, the, the illustrator of this pug magazine covered is effectively saying to the king, your people are hungry, maltreated, sick and dying. Soon there will be a people's uprising and autocratic leaders like yourself will be executed. Aha. Uh -huh. 
got to be up, sorry. Can't hear, sorry about that. Can you hear me? I should have asked. Thank you. Thank you. I should have asked. There you go. Ah, well, spared you, spared you a little bit anyway. <laughs> All right. There you go. This slide shows another historical book cover from 1878. This picture is a caricature of, of Uncle Sam, depicting how Native American Indians were exploited and conned out of their land. Sitting Bull is unable to understand that he's being fed, fed peace pap, or what American Indian policy was at the time. A silent, unstated look message of this book caricature is that Sitting Bull is virtually a sitting duck. The American Native Indians are now too weak to be able to, to negotiate with Uncle Sam. There are other aspects of travelling on and theatre troops which are discussed in the paper. This slide details some, some generic common denominators which are common to the development process most arts-based social movements go through. This slide articulates how, how there needs to be a non-violent broad-based social movement. That movement can be an arts and or theatre-based social movement trying to change the political climate where they operate. There needs to be a cohesive opposition coalition this means the travelling arts social movement must collaborate with, with other like-minded organisations who have no interest in, in arts or theatre, but do want to peacefully to bring an autocratic government who does not represent the peaceful to a non-violent end. Finally, we have the authoritarian regime. Genetically, that is, that is the development trajectory that most travelling arts and theatre social movements go through when they are delivering their political message in an autocratic state. This slide is an early picture of, of Madrid residents using open source urban planning as a media to create urban space and build democracy. The picture is from 2017. The social movement came about by a collaborative which included performance arts social movements and a crowdfunding initiative. We then need to mix in a system of laboratory which resulted from spontaneous inputs from ordinary people, academia and the intelligence of working together to repurpose space for the people. Citizens laboratories use digital tools and low-level, non-damaging, non-violent activism to reclaim repurposed vacant land. There is a significant element of co-production with, with different artists and, and arts and theatre social movements working alongside each other to bring vacant land back, back, in use, back into use of the people. Travelling arts groups help raise awareness and the contents of ongoing system lab schemes which act as a participant democracy medium. Radio is still alive and kicking in the 2020s at a medium which can communicate political messages in autocratic states. UNESCO 2022 informs that radio provides us with um, quick, affordable access to news in real time. Due to disinformation and misinformation in the COVID-19 era, trust of internet sources of information has declined. But there is an overall rise in trust in the news which, which includes radio broadcasts. UNESCO 2022 tells us that community radio provides a platform for minority groups and views which are underrepresented on mainstream media. It's this utility which makes radio the right source for art and theatre social movements. A generic approach to community radio adopted by performance art social movements is the creation of, of a new up to minute fact checking routines. A very short moment there. Where are we? There you go, just on the first. Uh, th this, this, this could work using the same format as, as say, for example, Rowan and Martin laughing that some people might remember or might have seen, I hope, uh, which, which actually once, um, once televised helped launch the careers of Woody Allen and Goldie Hawn. Community radio arts groups could deliver a news bulletin every two hours, which gives the new, news in real time. Community radio would broadcast alternative analysis on, for example, ongoing urban development, local food price changes, electricity and water shortages, coupled with expert non-state sponsored analysis of the reasons why these things are happening in the local area. This will be verified information which states from that and which, which national governments are, are, are not given to their people. Local dialects will, will be used by arts, arts social movements on community radio, which are not often heard on mainstream sources. So community radio will be a direct source of information not controlled by the autocratic regime. Community radio will, will be able to broadcast regular role, role plays of the day's news, providing a factual alternative narrative to the government's policy. Alongside highlights normally, Orally, how certain groups are negatively affected by government policy compared to others. 
Can you persuade us this can help hold governments to account by, ha by having ongoing store lines which reflect the nature of government policy and subsequent, and subsequent changes in that policy as time develops? In this regard, it can respond quicker than mainstream TV. Arts and theatre groups can use community radio to provide a response to critical information source to people at a relatively low price. This is why there are so many community radio art projects that, that, that are too numerous to mention. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa has a number of, of either autocratic or failing governments. Radio and or community radio is crucial for these populations who often do not have an internet access or television to keep people informed. And finally, briefly to conclude my presentation, I feel travelling arts and theatre social movements roles in, in revitalising democracy using various participatory democratic innovations can be, can be encapsulated as follows. The whole point of artistic expression of a political message is that everyone can hear it, see it and understand it. Everyone needs to know who the message is from. I do feel that's a key point that most presentations in this, con in this conference today have been trying to make. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Perspective on, on social mobilization. Uh -huh, sorry. Uh, thank you for, for uh, this perspective. Uh, I will now shortly open the floor because Benjamin has to leave. If someone has some questions, comments. Okay. You know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, just a brief question. Uh, I agree, it's an interesting perspective that art is a, or artistic expression is a good medium for attempting to somehow either uh, improve upon democratic features of a country or a community. Uh, are there any specific or any internal mechanisms that could prevent from art being abused in another in a different direction? You know, because. Propaganda also uses different artistic means for expressing violent ideas. So, how, how to protect from that? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that, that's a problem that many travelling groups actually face in, uh, in, 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 in a number of countries. Um, that could result in travelling groups either no longer existing and disbanding altogether, or they get driven underground. And there's quite a, good, there's quite a significant underground movement in Russia, China, a number of other places where people don't feel that they can operate on the surface or they're driven underground and they send anonymous messages but they are, but they are factual messages as well. And one of the things I found from a literature search is that um, many people are actually put off with engaging because they dare cease me to go along to these, um, these theatre shows, these art, these art pieces, but they do actually mention it in conversation and it does come up in current affairs media like etc. but people um, are, are having to do it one step removed because, because they're fearful of the autocratic state where, where they actually live, uh, fear of, of, of reprisals basically. So that's how different countries have, have like approached it. It either goes underground or people go one step removed and take your life from there. And that's the normal response, well, the usual response that I've found so far. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, we will continue with the... Um, um, example of Montenegro. Uh, it is my pleasure to announce uh, Bojan Bacha. Um, he is affiliated with the University of Göteborg and he will talk about enacting resistance, performing citizenship in uh, post-socialist Montenegro. Uh, thank you for having uh -huh. me. Can I just have my presentation? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I'll try to be relatively uh, uh, brief. So th this, this uh, presentation is in this paper is kind of a theoretical synthesis of three different projects I was working on of activism. 
and all of them uh, have been occurring uh, from the period of 2010 to 2015 and with a specific setting you have to kind of for those who don't know like Montenegro has been ruled by the same same party for three decades and also you can count it from 1945 since that party is a successor of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia and uh, uh, we had the first change at the ballot box of the regime uh, in our history two years ago so there's that so just briefly some 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 notions about post-socialist kind of civil society research the basic idea is that post-socialist transition of transformation kind of trans turned the weak civil society into strong civil sector when you had a kind of proliferation of NGOs who were mostly representing interests of donors within civil society rather than interests of uh, uh, society itself. And the idea was with the, 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 the strong civil, uh, civic sector, you had kind of strong uh, participatory activism and, uh, sorry, uh, transactional activism, so kind of advocacy, transfer of know-how and rather uh, weak uh, uh, activism from uh, below. So anti-politicality or apoliticality has been shown to be the defining feature of post-socialist uh, uh, civil societies, yet in recent years you kind of had the proliferation of scholarship on social movements and kind of contentious politics in Central and Eastern Europe. So, I mean, wine range were, of adjectives were used to, to describe how citizens participate in, in, uh, in, in between elections to exercise their kind of civic autonomy and political subjectivity. Yet what I found to be lacking is kind of understanding why apolitical segments of society kind of become political and how they comprehend their predicaments, articulate their grievances, make their demands, formulate their critiques, and justify their positions on political grounds. So basically, kind of, I was interested in the constitutions of citizens as political subjects by reclaiming and performing kind of their citizenship through acts of resistance. So the empirical material I used from this period of, uh, of 2010, 2015, and again, for those who are not familiar with Montenegro, you have to kind of uh, realize that uh, 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 for almost 15 years, kind of politics in Montenegro were turned into po ethno politics. So basically, there was a huge polarization between kind of loyal Montenegrins and disloyal Serbs. The, the split went after the independence referendum when Serbs were dominantly with union for union with Serbia and after that instead of being kind of incorporated as citizens they became enemies of the state and of course the regime functioned if you criticize any kind of policy or practices by the DPS you were immediately threat to the public order enemy of the state you are opposition to the state not to the ruling party. Uh, I was kind of working briefly kind of you had kind of two processes of depoliticization because Montenegro is a small country of half a million people basically so living uh, you know like half a million people basically living in a small territory marked by close personal and kinship ties so some research showed that basically forces that produce kind of uh, contention and mobilization large societies do not work as well in Montenegro because it's very hard to argue that Montenegro has a public space because you if you go out to protest you're not encountering strangers within five minutes you know everybody oh you're that person so it's very hard there is a sense of familiarity so that's why the non-anonymous society and on the other hand you had kind of this in addition to 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 kind of nepotism you had this vertical depoliticization kind of diffusion of communist party with the state so everything you know like you want you could resolve through social movements you can resolve through networks ah, i know a person who can do this or that so basically there is a result anything that would elsewhere kind of inspire collective action is primarily addressed through these kind of merger of horizontal and vertical patronage mechanisms so the, 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 the theoretical framework I was working in, I'm working now, and which really inspired me, it's kind of pragmatic sociology of, or sociology of critical capacity, depends how you want to call it, developed by Paul Tansky and Tim Vano. Basically, the idea is to kind of grasp uh, uh, research subjects, kind of reflexive insights during the and after the moments of, of dispute with the state 
and also how to, to analyze the normative principles to which they appeal to when they're justifying their activism or their goals as a fundamental element of theory construction. So one of the reasons I wanted to do is this, it's, I wanted to kind of jump on this bandwagon of kind of theorizing from post-socialism because usually you have this uh, idea that for many years, you know, like we were using concepts developed from the kind of historical experience of affluent Western democracies. And then we would just apply this concept to Eastern Europe. So everything, anything that does not fit in is kind of a pathology, deviation has to be removed. So I really wanted to try to, to, to kind of theorize from very specific kind of post-socialist experience. So the case studies are here, it's kind of, uh, the first one is we don't have a tradition of student movements, like we are, we are even differ there from the, the rest of former Yugoslavia. So kind of, uh, we had a wave of student uprisings, how this kind of notoriously a political group in Montenegro managed to politicize this uh, a role. So they went from technical student demands to very political demands. Then we had this brief few weeks ad hoc mobilization of urbanites. And I wanted to use this example to demonstrate how they found a common ground in civic values to set uh, aside deep ethno-political differences and articulate a novel joint anti-government platform for collective action. And the other thing is kind of, uh, has been my always kind of, kind of pet project and I was in, uh, in some ways also involved. It's a kind of uh, grassroots movement of villagers to demonstrate how a localized single issue environmental struggle became a nationwide movement by symbolically embodying numerous grievances that had been previously left unarticulated or unrepresented in the polity. So I was mostly working with kind of newspaper articles and interviews with activism and some movement material. So my idea was to see, to understand their political voice during the events as it was communicated in the public through newspaper articles and a kind of post festum interviews to, to see their reflections on uh, these events. So I was able to find, these are not exhaustive trajectories of political subjectification. That's why I call them kind of trajectories because there can be many. So there were three I was able to identify. So political becoming is a process through which a traditionally a political demographic group repoliticizes its social role. Political bonding, a process through which ordinary citizens exercise their civic autonomy by forging new political bonds between hitherto antagonistic collectives and political embodying, a process through which localized citizen-led struggle is given universal attributes, standing in as a symbolic representation of other marginalized grievances in the polity. So I'll try to be brief. These are kind of student movements where they were fighting for the autonomy of university and at the end kind of became a constitutive uh, uh, subject in the, what we called kind of, it was failed, but kind of Montenegrin spring with the, so they were able at the end of their protests to create this coalition with trade union activists and some uh, anti-corruption NGO activists. So there were kind of three critical moments since which students develop political competence to as university was always saying to them, you're, you know, like you're demanding what is not yours to demand. So one was the informal gatherings and kind of alternative organizing to fight corrupt practices of the umbrella student organization and publicize professional incompetence of the university management. Then it turned into kind of blockades and uh, occupations of university buildings to criticize neoliberal higher education policy reforms and associated austerity measures. And finally protests that took uh, place in two streets, two major cities, Podgorica and Nikšić, where the campuses are, to raise the student voice against the authoritarian rule of the DPS. So I will just go briefly because uh, you can read here, but uh, uh, basically through through my discussions with uh, uh, activists, uh, uh, kind of student leaders, basically what they said is how these kind of autonomous spaces they created uh, 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 and uh, which they insisted to be kind of horizontal in, na in nature. So basically to be the opposite of formal student organizations really help them, as they say, kind of become politically aware in terms of jointly identifying and addressing roots of social problems. So they started feeling more like citizens and not kind of mere machines of the reproduction of knowledge. And uh, as you can see, you know, like uh, by the end of these kind of encounters and blockades, blockades were mostly organized 
for the, the against the austerity measures introduced with for the the, the uh, money for the university, and basically that what they created was kind of. Uh, intellectually stimulating and emotionally supportive environment for students to get together, to organize, and finally to organize protests at the end. So the first protests started when they left the university building. It was still student affair. Then they left the university building. And then, of course, it turned into broader fight against government policy, authority measures, and of course, lack of job opportunities and job stability. So you can see clearly how, like, uh, they were moving from technical demands, you know, like we want better representation in student, uh, umbrella student organization to, you know, like fighting the, 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 the university management and certain policies. And at the end, they wanted to, uh, they were fighting the government. So briefly, uh, uh, they abandoned representative student structures uh, to do the things on their own. And during this time, they kind of developed a sense of their specific needs and interests. And at the end, of course, identify structural or political causes of their predicament. So for them, it wasn't just a, the matter of university. For them, was university was a symptom of corruption, partitocracy on the national level. And of course, they break the public image of Montenegrin students being civically disengaged and passive. And what was most interesting is that they were the spark that, that made trade union activists and some NGO activists to approach them and tell them like, okay, we need to take, we need to make this bigger. So we had on almost half a year Montenegrin spring protests in 2012 which they were failed, but this was kind of the first cross-sectoral anti-government protest that we had coming from uh, uh, below. So instead of being organized by political parties, this was the, the first. The second one was basically, this was uh, happening, you can uh, uh, see, it started as a, a, a it started as 10 protests of this kind of uh, conservative, traditionalist, pro-Serb party. And there was a lot of, uh, uh, um, the protests were small, only a few hundred people, but for several weeks. Uh, and then these protests were mostly kind of really conservative. There was a lot of uh, Serb nationalist rhetoric, iconography, etc. But then one early morning, police violently raided the tent and violated constitutional right of the protesters together. So a, a group of uh, activists, uh, citizens, organized on Facebook, and they wrote through protest letters, uh, which were supported by hundreds and then even thousands of people, where they basically uh, uh, started to defend the rights of the protesters who they're not agreeing with. So they were against the politics of the protesters, but their idea were, you, you know, like we have to get together and defend the rights of those who, whose politics we don't agree. So uh, uh, basically, when I was talking to, 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 to my uh, uh, respondents, uh, one of the problems they were encountering is this kind of merger of party affiliation and ethno-national belonging. So, you know, like you are, if you are with DPS, the ruling, then ruling party, you're a true Montenegrin, a true patriot, and whatnot. If you're against it, you know, like, you cannot be a Montenegrin. You are immediately a Serb, a Chetnik, whatever. So the idea was, uh, and as one of the respondents, she said, uh, uh, and the national uh, identity is posed without the right to object. Anyone who expresses his or her criticism toward the DPS policies or practices ends up being viewed as a Serb nationalist and as a disloyal citizen. So in the, as you can see here in the, uh, when the, there was a raid of the tent city, they saw it as their duty to embrace civil disobedience and resistance to oppression and engage in organized action uh, uh, of people against the state violence, even if it meant fighting for the rights of those whose politics they did not support. So the problem was how to find a kind of symbolic unifier in a context where you know, like politics do not uh, move along the right-left uh, spectrum, but kind of civic-ethnic axis. So uh, uh, 
you can see kind of the, with the combination of kind of ethnopolitics throughout the former Yugoslavia, the notion of civic or civicness uh, became kind of created with urban habitus, cosmopolitan outlook, elitist kind of civility of the liberal middle class. So anything that did not fit into this kind of ideological turned aesthetical parameters of the dominant understanding of the civic values was delegitimized as non-civil and thus ethno-nationalist by default. So for my respondents, this kind of civic worldview entails what it advocates should believe, do, uh, believe and do as political beings and with whom they should cooperate, which in particular excluded the protesters who were then seen and perceived as this is just some of the, the adjectives they use, so like backward, primitive, uncivilized, etc. So they refused to accept this position as civic. Uh, instead of calling it grajanistički, I don't know if citizenist is the best translation, but I was trying to go with something. Uh, so for them, which was for me really interesting, is that the citizenist discourse was one and the same as ethno-nationalist re rhetoric in its exclusionary zeal. It demonized, demonized the underclass who were often defined primarily by their ethnicity and nationality. So they really wanted to, to kind of find the, the civic as a unifier, as a members of a political rather than ethno-national community. But uh, uh, they, in that sense, they really declined to vilify members of the alleged uncivil society ravaged by socioeconomic restructuring during transition, who they saw as true losers of transition. And I really like this quote, is that, uh, uh, that every individual and every group wants to be tolerated, but no one wants to show solidarity. Uh, so they really were kind of idealistic in treating their kind of conservatism and traditionalism as a symptoms of brutal social injustices and their focus was kind of on class-based issues. So they really want to get the, the, the lowest common denominator to unify these people, you know, like we're mad kind of because we're poor, but let's try to embrace this inclusive civic framework rather than exclusive citizenist framework. So for them, civicness meant uh, kind of a course of action based on compromises between abundant diversities in Montenegrin society and their need to protect public good. Uh, another thing is, and this is, for example, from their, one of their petitions, uh, at the moment when repressive state perhaps openly carries out aggression against its own citizens, all existing divisions of ethnicity, nationality, political party, ideology, religion, gender, sexuality, generational disappear. That's one of their kind of proclamation document. And what was really interesting here, because this was a kind of a Montenegrin version of we are the 99%, but what they really call their position kind of a national republicanism, which is interesting. Uh, and this is how they described it. It's predicated upon the consensus that Montenegro is a country of its citizens, regardless of their ethno-national belonging or political aff uh, affiliations, and an awareness that institutions arrested by political parties do not see all citizens equally. Now, they, two of their kind of petitions really created a momentum, so more than 10,000 people following kind of their ideas came to the streets to exercise the solidarity with the wrong protesters and then the police was more brutal than ever basically than we had uh, we never seen this in Montenegro usually police is not that violent in Montenegro but this time like for days you couldn't go out to do the, the, the tear gas and everything so but what was most interesting for me, kind of, and I, the, the final, as opposed to kind of previous elite driven attempts in establishing civic values as a symbolic unifier of ethno nationally divided in Montenegrin society. So, usually political parties go, we need to reconcile divided Montenegrins in Serbs. So, they were treating it as these uh, two ethno national groups. For them, it wasn't about that. It was reinventing these political bonds from below and grounding their civic values in civic liberty, social justice, republican order, and of course, empathy and solidarity, but between individuals as members of political community, not at any point as members of any national uh, 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 or ethnic group. And this is finally, I'll, I'll try to be, how, how much time do I have? No, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, and this is the, the environmental movement which really became kind of a, a, a symbol of resistance in Montenegro. Uh, um, 
And what's, what's really interesting, we have, we have a lot of these kind of uh, uh, rural movements. And during this movement, there were like maybe 15 or 20 others fighting for healthy environment in rural Montenegro. But this one really, this one lasted for four years. And it really became a, 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 a symbol of resistance. So on one hand, they had these kind of really tenacious co coordinating co collective repertoires of political contention in physical spaces aimed at specifically writing the wrong. For them, it was to stop the, 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 the basically dumping ground because in their village, they had this mountain of, of garbage half a million tons when they started protesting it, of unprocessed waste, so medical waste, uh, like carcasses of animals, etc. <laughs> but what really kind of made, their, uh, uh, made them uh, the thing was this kind of spontaneous, uh, the, the collective actions were complemented by spontaneous and individual tactics of everyday resistance, mostly on Facebook where they expose this wrong, among others, as a symptom of structural injustices common throughout the country. And of course, with, with this tactic, there are kind of two types of images I show you. So one is the dissemination of the upsetting uh, visual representations of the dump and their confrontations with the police. And the other is the creation of Port Beran page of Facebook, which kind of served as um, project that lampooned the establishment, so they created this parallel city where all the election, DPS's election promises were fulfilled. So this is how our city would look like. And, oh, oops. Uh, so this is the dump. You can see when it caught on fire, it was releasing dioxin. This is just one. And you can see like everything what was in the river. So basically when I asked them, like first they had to, to fight the local authority you know, like, because uh, I'm, I'm from Berane, and until I see, seen this on, 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 on Facebook, I didn't know it was happening. And they said, uh, basically, you know, like, the gesture that they said they were releasing images to make the townsfolk see where their trash ends up, where it is hidden, in the backyard of their town, but in our homes. So, uh, and they really wanted to, 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 uh, address, as they were saying the, uh, uh, through pictures, a crime in progress, a crime, crime against one village, one town, one region, demonstrating that official policies aimed at protecting the environment were nothing but a lie, that Berancelos residents were not standing in the way of progress, as the authorities claims, but instead were preventing the environmental apocalypse. So they wanted to address the public directly to photographs unmediated by the words that can be twisted and turn anything into another ethno-political identity issues. You know, like in Montenegro, it depends if you write nisam or niesam, you can immediately be turned into, you know, like in Beranese, for example, specific. Unlike most of the Montenegro, we don't say niesam, we say niesam. And we don't say sutra, sutra. So, uh, it was a fundamental importance in providing evidence of the injustices that everyone in Montenegro talks about, but is seldom uh, able to support with facts and thus giving to the public proof that the other side, the official side, was lying. So this is, for example, how they started when uh, they, their billboard was, when they published in the town square, the billboard with pictures of the dump. And of course, the local authorities, this is 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. The, the mayor said to the, the, the fire department, take it down and everything. And this is when they reopened it. They want the court case for the billboard to be reopened after two years. So that's one of the things. So in Port Berane was kind of alternative history of Berane through kind of creative editing of images kind of former industrial town, Berane is in the coastal part, was symbolically re relocated from a poor continental area to the we wealthy coastal region where it became kind of a, uh, a tourist giant. And as Nebosha said, it became a municipality where elites use privatization and corruption for good of all its citizens. So the, you will see, for example, how they introduced, the, they started, they made a railway and everything, you know, like these are promises, for example, of reopening Berane Airport, which never happens, of course, we have a, so their idea was, you know, like we are a dying industrial town, so they re relocated, they brought the sea so we can be, uh, as I don't know if I put this quote, but they said basically they made Berane uh, a third world country within Montenegro. 
And so the, the interesting thing was when the dam became the part of their kind of imaginarium, it kind of translated political oppression and structural injustices into visual representation of a kind of concrete, tangible, and kind of visceral problem that could be wildly identified and therefore identify with. A town in which privatization, incompetence, and corruption had not destroyed its infrastructure, local industry, and people's lives. And of course, this is just some briefly, basically what, for me, what was really interesting, it, they really kind of deconstructed this neo, uh, neoliberal narrative of progress. You know, like we have to build this, we have, but they were saying, yes, kind of progress for you, but at our expense. So they really started problematizing, you know, like this unquestionable strategic goals, like what's the actual price of that? And uh, again, the protests that I mentioned, Montenegro and Spink, were all often opened with, we are all Berancelo, because kind of Berancelo became a, a, a kind of a, a, a label of doing something uh, uh, in the shared political goals rather than, 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 than the specific uh, uh, injustice associated with Berancelo. So it really started representing the, the numerous individuals and collectives who really brought uh, 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 numerous issues like environmental harm, social justice, and constitutional abuse in, uh, to the fore. And of course, by the end of their struggle, they, they were triumphant. The, the, the NAMP was closed 2014, and environmental remediation was completed by the end of 2018. So this was kind of the first big defeat of the ruling regime. And of course, this is one of the oldest protesters. He was 94. <laughs> Uh, when he was uh, in front of the, the, the police, uh, and at the end they built him a, a monument to overlook the, 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 the village and the city because he was really kind of tenacious and really didn't want to. He was arrested numerous times. So, uh, just briefly in a minute. So, the, kind of the first case study political becoming for me was uh, really interested because it really denotes kind of a gradual transformation from the initial intent to fight only for one's personal interests for, into a willingness to fight for broader causes that benefit all citizens. In the case of students, the political bonding was for me interested because kind of civic values were re, re, uh, redefined from below as a symbolic kind of unifier for joint actions and really kind of created uh, new polit bonds between ethno-politically divided citizens around one goal. For example, it was the defense of constitutional order and the rights and liberties in its guarantees. And of course, kind of civicness was detached from the notion of civility. So, you know, like you could be really radical and do something and not allowing, you know, like an urban middle class to tell you, well, you're a barbarian or whatever. And the third one uh, uh, was basically how through political embodying instead of simply kind of representing the grievances of one village, one single issue, the idea of Berancelo came to embody all communities across the country that face similar injustices alongside the demand that they should have a say in the decision making. So also Berancelo became a threat in other villages. If you don't do this, you will have another Berancelo. And of course, kind of the, the, the lessons of political subjectification, I was trying, you know, like kind of to, to, to give it kind of a, a theoretical conc conclusion what political subjectification means, for example, contra identification. So basically when people disconnect from their already existing identities and perform citizenship that depending on the situation and relations takes divergent trajectories in politically emancipating either to disengage and strange if not antagonistic individuals and collectives, prompting them to pursue their co common goals under a new symbolic unifier. And of course, the process is democratic to the extent that citizens not only interact with authorities on an equal footing, but also move in between the, and beyond their extant political affiliation, social positions, and political belongings. So it wasn't just an articulation of a new political narrative, but the creation of new inclusive and egalitarian spaces of political enunciation, of relations which motivate and empower citizens to contest in, in egalitarian logic of social order, challenge political authorities, question national dogmas, 
practice civil disobedience, and of course, provide alternative solutions. So I'll end here. Thank you. <laughs>
and opposition political party members too. Uh, the field work was implemented in December uh, 2019 uh, and 2020, while selected cases were not in their active mode. They were quite all finished of, of this. Uh, uh, let's uh, begin from the political process uh, and beginning of the civil activists. One of the main influential factors uh, in development of the selected movement uh, was the political process occurring in that period of Georgia. The new government, President Mikhail Saakashvili, a national movement, his political party, which came to power after the Rose Revolution, uh, gained tremendous social, uh, support from their citizens and, however, in few uh, years, trust towards the government and Saakashvili uh, decreased and transferred to the opposite attitude towards the ruling party. The beginning uh, of the selected movements uh, coincided with the rise of a negative attitude to the Saakashvili government and continued during the governance of the Georgian dream, uh, dream which came to the power after the parliamentary election of um, 2012. Uh, new urban is created by the increasing importance of the uh, private economic and foreign capital and to transform the environment of the city uh, from the modern to postmodern one. Consequently, in-depth changes will happen in the urban area and in Tbilisi too. Uh, let's uh, now have a brief history of these uh, two cases. Uh, Gudiashvili Square is uh, the oldest square in Georgia, in Tbilisi. Uh, it, is, uh, it consists of 11 buildings uh, and a small square uh, inside of these buildings. Uh, and uh, it dated in, uh, back to 19th century. From, uh, from the Rose Revolution, new government initiated restoration of the historical parts of uh, Tbilisi. Uh, and uh, they initiated to restore Gudiashvili Square too. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> this picture, uh, this photo is uh, before uh, the restoration. <laughs> now Gudiashvili Square is restored and uh, it's, uh, it's very, very good uh, uh, now to see this restoration. However, there was no step forward in rehabilitation and construction of the Gudiashvili Square. The movement that aimed to save Gudiashvili Square was led by uh, civil society organization Tiflisi Hamkari uh, and uh, it, it began in uh, 2011. Uh, after publicizing the renovation project of the square prepared by the Austrian company Zechner and Zechner. Uh, this company uh, uh, wanted uh, to restore this uh, square. Uh, it, um, this company was the winner uh, of the competition uh, for the restoration of the, um, the square and uh, they wanted uh, in their project uh, to remake these historical buildings and reconstructed it uh, in new offices, uh, new trade centers, and uh, quite nothing from the uh, old 19th century uh, buildings. Uh, so, so it was the main reason uh, for uh, beginning this movement, say with the Ashwili Square, which was one of the most uh, long-lasting movements. Uh, it lasted nearly five uh, or six uh, years and was the most successful uh, movement. Uh, the next one is uh, Wake Park. Uh, Wake Park situates in the most uh, prestigious part of the city. It's not in Old Tbilisi, but the most prestigious. Uh, uh, district in Tbilisi, uh, and from the very beginning of the Soviet period, it was uh, the main recreational area for uh, Tbilisi citizens, the most beloved place for uh, uh, having fresh air here. Uh, the city government presented a rehabilitation project during the Saakashvili governance uh, of the Veke Park. The idea of construction of the five-floor hotel in the middle of the garden determined protest of the society. So uh, imagine that uh, in this park uh, they wanted, uh, they permitted to build five, uh, five floor hotel. So uh, it was the reason to begin this uh, movement, this, uh, social movement. After the project presentation, various protest activities were arranged, which led to the initiative group named uh, Guerrilla Gardeners. 
uh, at the initial stage of the movement, they uh, prepared the petition called Save the Weke Park, and the name uh, of this movement came from this uh, petition. Uh, organized a series of protests, relies in Weke Park City Hall or City Council. Uh, and after Georgian Dream came into power, uh, the local self-government, uh, new local self-government uh, and new city government changed its attitude towards the issue. Uh, so it is one, uh, one success of cases too. Uh, let's go uh, to the uh, main features of our uh, two cases. The tactic is one of the main factors influencing the results of every resistant movement. In both selected cases, government used the same strategy, and it aimed uh, to marginalize civil activists. So, labeling activists as NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, and TAGA is a regular part of the social movement, and it was also in Tbilisi in these cases. Uh, also, in uh, these cases, um, government described, tried to describe activists as opponents of the development, of opponents of the development of the city, opponents of the modern uh, history, and so and so. Uh, and activists underline, had to underline that they are not opponents, but proponents of the development, uh, sustainable, but sustainable development. As one of the uh, respondents told, uh, told me during the interview that they were trying to, uh, to <coughs> opposite governments, that they are all pro proponents, but of sustainable development proponents. Another provoker of the social movements is the lack of dialogue between the local bodies and government, uh, government and citizens. The lack of cooperation and communication uh, between government and uh, society is notable in the selected cases. The officials approved the Gudiashvili Square uh, development project without public discussion, without any public discussion uh, and any public consultation. Consultations. So the same was uh, with the case of uh, Wacky Park. Everything is done. Oh, let's. Uh, we have investors. We have uh, to fund this uh, urbanization project. And now let's see this. But everything is okay. Uh, in. Uh, in uh, 2014, after the local elections, the ruling national movement party and mayor, who approved both projects, lost. So the winner, Georgian Dream, came to power, and the new government put the responsibility for the decisions of the previous government. It's a usual thing in Georgia, and it will be easy too. Uh, however, however, we do not see uh, changes in perceptions. Wrongdoers are only investors attempting to uh, obtain permissions for their projects, but not officials uh, or institutions approving this, uh, this development, so development. Uh, as we have already mentioned, uh, the protest tactics uh, is uh, one of the main determinators of the results gained by the movement. Uh, they have a variety of, uh, uh, during this movement, they have a variety of the methods to choose from. In the case of, say, Gudiashvili Square, so uh, this is the um, photos from Gudiashvili Square and uh, from Veke Park. Uh, uh, the <coughs> Tiflisi Hamkari, the leader unit of the civil movement, even from the initial stage of the protest, uh, started to use uh, the positive mode of campaign. No relies, no strikes, no demonstrations with go, go home government, go home political parties, and so and so. Uh, discussing, uh, while discussing urban movements, for example, Manuel Castells underlines that one of the crucial aspects of this type of movement uh, is its central point to the city as an area of public uh, usage. So, uh, Tiflisi Hamkari and Udiashvili Squares and Wakeper activists. Uh, wanted to show to the government that this square and this park was uh, the area for public usage. So uh, it's not uh, the government's area, it's citizens' area. And they wanted to have the, their festivals, uh, the, uh, concerts, uh, literature, um, some kind of poetry, and so and so. Uh, so it was uh, very unusual for uh, the so social activist uh, history in Georgia to have such kind of protests. 
no uh, demands, uh, pol no political demands, uh, nothing about political parties, nothing about that uh, the government is bad, only concerts, only clean wine and uh, um, exhibitions and so and so. Uh, it was uh, the first time and maybe the last time <laughs> these, these two cases, uh, it was truly, fully, uh, absolutely a political uh, demands. Uh, so, uh, what about the political parties? It's, uh, it's very interesting, yes? Uh, activists and the political parties. Usually, engagement of the, pol to the, of the political parties in so urban activists is evaluated uh, as a uh, positive fact, especially when political parties find a place for urban development in their programs and vision. However, in selected cases, protest campaigns was uh, entirely designed and managed by the civil society without politicians. Uh, uh, politicians in the protest were involved as citizens, but not representatives of, uh, of any political body. The main explanation is that towards the political parties in the society, Georgian society, uh, the trust is uh, minimal, it's very, <laughs> very low. Same time, protest organizers acknowledge that there was a, a stage during the campaign when it was impossible to avoid uh, cooperation with the politicians because, as one of the respondents tell me, every activist was a play in the field of politics, so political decisions are made by the politicians. Uh, and during the parliamentary elections in uh, 2012, uh, uh, it was a unique experience because it was the first time in the history of independent Georgia when the government changed by the election and this change created so-called window opportunity and uh, in uh, Save the Kudiashvili Square movement activists negotiated with the new government, they cooperated with them and they gained the results. Uh, uh, investor omitted uh, the implementation of the project because representatives of the new government uh, and the uh, municipality declared that they would not support technical aspects and permits included in the project approved by the previous government. So, analogically was uh, in Wake Park, defenders uh, used government changes in uh, political system uh, as much as the previous government approved construction permission representative of the national movement. For the new government, it was politically appropriate to support protesters and back their demands. Uh, so we can conclude. Uh, we can conclude. Civic activists for protecting Udiashvili Square and Wake Park has succeeded as a result of a consistent, well-planned campaign. We'll choose the strategies during the activist period is one of the main reasons which underwent some modifications according to this stage. Uh, the second one is the protest repertoire in experience to the citizens of Tbilisi, so to which they uh, felt that they were the organizers of the rally and not only participants, but they, they are organizing these rallies, uh, contributed to the success of the movement. Uh, uh, and finally, change of central and local government and proper use of the window of opportunity by the current political processes have made the same with the Ashwili and say Wake Park protests in Georgia is successful, interesting and most distinguished uh, moments. Thank you very much. Sigrist here also from uh, University of Gothenburg and um, yeah, the floor is yours. We have two more panelists and we have... Right. One panelist, only one paper. Oh, well, well, okay. Okay, so how do I... Uh... I will help you. Okay. okay, I will try to be brief since we're running a bit out of time here and we want time for the discussions also. Can you hear me or should I move this closer? Yes. Is this better? Yeah, good. All right, but one of the perks, I suppose, of being uh, one of the final panels, uh, part of the final panels, is that you can sort of think about how your presentation relates to prior discussions we've had these few days. And I really found this quite interesting to listen to urban movements in Tbilisi, but also the autonomous spaces established, of course, by the student activists. And harking back to yesterday, I think the discussions about the right to the city and most importantly, the great activist walk we had yesterday also really ties into my presentation today. 
but first a bit of a presentation about in what context I'm, I'm writing this paper and what, what it represents. So you can view it as a, as a pilot project for my PhD thesis since I started quite recently and this has been a way for me to work with a pet project on heterotopia, which I'll get back to in a second, within this larger research project on, on struggles for urban alternatives in the context, context of neoliberal urban governance or entrepreneurial governance. And in this sort of uh, research interest, I have a specific focus on, on squatting as a social movement, a political practice and a cultural practice, and also autonomous activism more broadly. And speaking a little bit on this project before I move on to this specific paper, I'm, it basically responds to a research gap in, in squatting in, in many post-socialist contexts within the field of research on, on squatting as a, as a movement which is very based on sort of the neoliberalization of the welfare state and the post-40 city. And of course, we have reason to believe that things may not be different. Things may be different in, in different contexts, but there's not much research there. And this uh, paper then sketches at a theoretical framework for... Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, here, this was the slide. Uh, this paper sketches at a theoretical framework using some old prior, quite limited empirical material. It builds on a prior article I wrote, exploring Metelkova's relation to urban and political developments in Ljubljana and Slovenia. I'll get back to Metelkova later for those of you who aren't familiar with it. I assume a lot of people are familiar. But here you can see a picture and I will show a few more pictures moving forward. And it's quite nice for me to come here because I'm, I'm learning a lot by this conference and I'm moving forward. I'm also quite interested in studying the Ljubljana context along with the Belgrade context. So this has been a great learning experience for me. Yes. Uh, so the background for this paper, I connect chiefly to the field of critical urban theory and critical urban studies, where Neil Brenner is a, a core figure. And he formulates one of the key features of critical urban theory as recovering or excavating the late and theoretical abstract urban alternatives which haunt contemporary capitalist cities. For him, this becomes a starting point for the critique of existing power relations as they uh, manifest themselves in the urban sphere and also depoliticization, and we talk about post-democratic cities and so on. Um, and I think this uh, formulation is quite nice and interesting, but I question uh, the way he and many other researchers have sort of posited urban alternatives as this abstract or theoretical possibility. And instead I want to connect uh, more to the research on collective action and, and movements in, in positing that there are actually existing urban alternatives and sort of put these and how these are constructed through struggles at the forefront of the critical urban research agenda. Yes, so the purpose uh, quite simply of this paper is to try to provide, a, provide an outline for studying such spatial configured collective action, urban alternatives, uh, which is, if nothing else, quite relevant for my dissertation thesis. Um, and I turn to the notion of heterotopia, which I will go on to discuss in a second. And I then apply this framework to the case of Metelkova, which I'll come back to also. And well, the research questions are, it's a quite a concept, conceptual paper, so they are basically how can you use heterotopia as a tool to theorize and understand these contemporary struggles? And also how can we relate to, oh, <laughs> I keep forgetting, uh, how can we, uh, uh, understand this tension between the dominant and the alternative urbanism and what does this really represent dominant versus alternative yes and i have this second question there but let's blast through this so the empirical material as i said is quite limited and uh, it consists of uh, only six qualitative interviews with key activists which i focus quite in depth on in this paper but beyond the uh, activist interviews, there's also a lot of uh, textual analysis and, and some ethnographic fieldwork spending a few weeks uh, in Metalkova, which informed the analysis, but it's still quite limited. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to starting with the fieldwork. Um, but yes, heterotopia, it, it can literally be trans translated to other space, so hetero, other, space, topia. And it was coined by Foucault initially in a quite a lofty, weird paper, where he defines it in terms of counter spaces, enacted utopia, alternative sites which mirror the, the way society is structured. But it's quite difficult to draw on Foucault's definition because it's, 
so tedious and goes in so many different directions at the same time. He talks about the ship, the graveyard as a heterotopia, uh, the amusement park is heterotopia, and in applications of Foucault, we, it expands even further. Suddenly, the bathroom is a heterotopia, the brothel is a heterotopia. So it's quite, uh, it's been criticized by David Harvey and, and Peter Johnson for being this very loose and undefined concept and quite confusing. And it has also been developed in various different directions by, oh. <laughs> by uh, for instance, Lefebvre, uh, Hetherington, and Soja, and it's, it's quite diverse. So I felt the need to sort of return to some of uh, the initial definitions of heterotopia and reinterpret them in line with collective action, social change, and urban governance, specifically in relation to what I uh, call neoliberal urbanism. It goes by a few different names in the literature, entrepreneurial, managerial urbanism, and so on. Uh, but I draw particularly on David Harvey and Margaret Meyer. In the interest of time, I will just leave it at that, but it's, of course, a much bigger discussion how we conceptualize urban governance. Um, but yes, uh, building on Lefebvre, I find a lot of utility in Lefebvre. I um, approach Heptopia as very positive relationally and contextually uh, in relation to what Lefebvre calls the dominant praxis, which is then, of course, uh, urban governance and, and market-driven policies of urban governance. And again, drawing on the fab, these can be considered then sites of uh, excluded needs and desires which are articulated and manifested through collective action. And very importantly, in this definition, heterotopia becomes not pure sites of emancipation or pure sites of resistance, but always relational. They always risk recuperation, normalization, and so processes, such processes. And this has been quite neatly showcased by some recent applications of the, of the term in the literature, whereas a lot of, of the literature still idealizes heterotopia as these pure idealistic sites, I think. And I connect to these more critical perspectives, especially when it comes to squatting and autonomous activism, as we will see. <laughs> and then building on, on this definition, this reinterpretation along with Lefebvre specifically, but also some prior literature, I move away from talking about heterotopic spaces to talking about heterotopic struggles uh, as a way to connect the dots between urban struggles over space and uh, these, the extant heterotopia literature, which, which doesn't really consider struggles, it just thinks about different alternative spaces. And uh, this is a way to connect it with the right to the city literature, as I highlight there. And again, this, this definition, if you connect it to the prior literature, you quite clearly see that the risks of incorporation into place planning strategies, normalization, but also demonization eviction becomes uh, key, key struggles for heterotopia within the context of neoliberal or entrepreneurial urban governance. Uh, so, moving into my case then, Metalkova. Uh, Metalkova is a, a squatted autonomous cultural center located in the city center of Ljubljana. It's uh, quite large for being a squat. It consists of seven buildings and the area between them, which spans uh, a little bit over 12,000 square meters. It's been squatted for almost 30 years now and has gone through various processes in this development. And if you look at, at its position within, uh, within uh, Ljubljana, you can see it's quite clearly connected to the anarchist scene, which is quite large, but also the alternative cultural scene. And increasingly, it has become this tourist attraction, which uh, part of the city is branding a little bit. But if we think of heterotopic struggles, so heterotopia, metalcolous heterotopia, which struggles are connected to it, we can think of primarily uh, its connectedness to urban movements, contesting gentrification, touristification of the city center, which is very prevalent. Um, also other movements historically, such as the LGBTQ movement historically, but let's not go into that for the time being. Uh, but we can also think of more internal struggles for uh, remaining an autonomous space in face of these threats of, of eviction on the one hand and uh, normalization and uh, uh, legalization on the other hand. And I think this is a lot of what my analysis focuses on, uh, precisely how this uh, other status as this tourist attraction but uh, a cultural alternative site grants Metalkova uh, some pr protection from eviction if you compare it to many other squats or autonomous spaces. But at the same time, uh, it legitimizes attempts or strategies to incorporate it into a jurisdictional and cultural mainstream. So there's a lot of legalizing and normalizing pressure. And the activists I talked to then construe this protection 
in terms of being this alternative cultural institution in Ljubljana as a double-edged sword, which always led to uh, commodification and commercialization of the space, and thus was a threat to their perceived autonomy. And then a lot of these struggles were very centered on how to defend autonomy, both from th threats from within, so inside tendencies towards legalization perhaps, but also from outside, so municipal pressures to become a legalized ent ent entity and so on. And it was quite interesting to discover this very pronounced uh, amb ambiguous tension between on the one hand uh, being part of the entrepreneurial city branding as this tourist attraction which had a very, especially during the summer months, a very strong pull factor on the tourists. There are a lot of tourists I think came only to experience Metalkova and also some other sites maybe, but uh, at the same time it also had this very other uh, position within, within the uh, uh, entrepreneurial city as this point where you could push away what my interviews called unwanted populations from the picturesque city center. So you could keep the city center clean and uh, gentrified and sort of put these problematic populations such as uh, to some extent the homeless but also uh, drug users uh, in, in Metalkova and also Rog, which was uh, uh, another autonomous space at the time now evicted. So we can see this very clearly dialectical interplay between the governance of Ljubljana and Metelkova and how Metelkova is shaped. Um, yes, and if you then go within Metelkova, you can see that the different conceptions of, of what Metelkova was and what its purpose was led to very different diagnostics on how to deal with this issue, which was at the time I was there very much centered around the issue of how to deal with the presence of drug users and, and uh, and uh, the sale of drugs within Metalkova, hard drugs specifically. For the cultural activists who primarily use Metalkova as a site to organize alternative cultural events, uh, quite easy and quite uh, cheap, this was an existential threat to Metalkova as an autonomous space, uh, which necessit necessit necessitated uh, drastic action, such as perhaps legalizing yourself, perhaps further collaboration with police, or just uh, grouping together and kicking, kicking the pushers out violently. Uh, whereas for the more uh, anarchist activists, Metulkova was a completely different space for them. And uh, it was a space that sort of provided this, uh, a site for the excluded needs within Metulkova. And from that perspective, sort of the needs of drug users and uh, youth and alternative activists were sort of on par. So as long as no one broke the rules of harassment and so on, you, you couldn't kick someone out and in fact, Attempting such strategies was then on par also with, with uh, the perceived authoritarian rule of, of Slovenia and, and Ljubljana, the outside position. Uh, yeah, but a bit more interestingly, if you compare to the, the wider field of research on, on uh, autonomous spaces and squats in, in Western uh, Europe, uh, so Christiana is a big one, uh, Metalkova really was imbued with a, a very large sense of importance by the activists in providing a spatial guarantee for democratic openness uh, in the context of post-socialist centralism in Europe. One of my interviews told me, for instance, that, well, if we have a different situation here than we do in Hungary and Poland, it's always because we had uh, Metalkova. Uh, so we have this space which is not NGO-driven, which can provide novel political horizon and a space uh, for organizing protests. Uh, uh, and uh, that's outside of formal politics. Uh, so here we see that the heterotopic struggles and the struggles for autonomy, for the activists, they are more important than just having this alternative space. It's, it's a very key question of democracy as such, uh, beyond the confines of, of Metalkova or uh, Ljubljana. Uh, yes. So just to round uh, off here, um, I think the, the struggles uh, I, I w was able to analyze really showcase how Metalkova and, and uh, heterotopic struggles, heterotopic spaces cannot be considered idealized or pure outside positions from the city or the urban context, but rather we, we have to consider them uh, as profoundly shaped by their context, their, their urban settings, uh, and the developments in the urban settings really feed back into the spaces and vice versa, which is also very visible with the issue of gentrification, where Metalkova provides a gentrifying effect on the outside area, which then feeds back into what 
Metal Kova activists are permitted to do somehow in order to comply with these new rules of the game in the gentrified city. And as there were also these legacies of the post-socialist experiences. Um, yes, and returning a little bit to the issue of, of hard narcotics being used and sold, uh, again, this really showcases how Metal Kova uh, and heterotopic sites uh, are profoundly shaped by the ongoing developments and exclusions within the city. It might sound like I'm kicking in some open doors here, so of course this is very self-evident, but, but within the heterotopia literature and some critical urban literature, people would perhaps tend towards a more idealistic account, and that's what I'm trying to break with here. Uh, but at the same time, it is very important to recognize that this uh, uh, counter space of Metelkova also enabled space-specific uh, place specific, uh, struggles and identities which were able to mobilize critique and protest movements against those very exclusions and tensions that all perform the space. So that's where I will uh, leave off. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we have now our uh, host. Irena Fike, Tjelena Vasiljevic and Gazela Pudar Draško and they will uh, talk about social movements and internal democracy. Mm -hmm. Jelena, thank you, thank you, the leader. Uh, Gazela and I will talk and Gazela will have a presentation, right? Gazella, yeah. And I will just give a brief um, uh, contextual information. So I will contextualize our, our research just to give you an idea uh, uh, what we actually, um, I can actually use this one, yeah, it's better. Yes, so I think Just to give you some information about uh, what this reason was part of and uh, how we devise research questions. So this is actually part of the Horizon project. Our institute is, uh, is a consortium member of the Horizon 2020 project called End Trust. It's about trust and distrust uh, in Europe. It's about investigating ways in which we can enhance trust in governance on local, na national, and, and European level. And it's a, a very di internally diverse project. It has different working packages looking at very different um, levels of of social interaction where, where tr this trust dynamic uh, kind of sh uh, takes place. And we are leaders, uh, our institute leads a uh, uh, working package on social movements. So we want to explore social movements as vehicles and actors of channeling trust or as possible arenas where disenchanted citizens can invest their trust uh, taken away from political parties and then possibly invested in social movements. So we were interested in social movements and we wanted to see uh, how, what is their dynamic of, of trust, distrust, and how they, uh, how they fit into this, uh, into this story about trust and distrust. Uh, our idea was so we, what we wanted to do, uh, because uh, we have seven countries, seven European countries part of this project. Uh, uh, Italy, Greece, Poland, Denmark, Germany, uh, and us. So this is six, right? Have I missed someone? Because I didn't know. Czech Republic, yeah, Czech Republic, I mean, Czech. Okay, so uh, our idea was uh, to, and this is how the research process went. Uh, so first, uh, we wanted them, we wanted our partners from each country to do a mapping of, of democratic progressive social movements. So we gave them clear cri criteria what we mean by democratic uh, social movements. They had to be inclusive, um, they had to nourish certain values, they also had to be active in the times of, time of research, they had to be visible in public space. So they had this set of criteria and we wanted, we wanted them to show us um, or what would be the eligible sample for, for research. So they came up with a list of, I don't know, five to six movements. And then we decided for each country, a team member of the, of the project, to select two social movements for the research sample. And then we kind of, we wanted to, and we, we had this idea that in every country we had a movement that was very active on environmental issues. So each country had an environmental movement in the, in the sample. And then we wanted to have another, another example of social movements that deals with socioeconomic issues. 
So our idea was to have one, so, uh, one social movement based on, uh, focused on socioeconomic issues, one on environmental movements, but that wasn't really possible in all the countries, so we ended up with uh, some countries actually uh, taking into consideration uh, movements dealing with uh, women's rights issues or with LGBTQ issues. That was in Greece, Italy, and Poland. Poland, of course, because uh, women's strikes was, was very, very important. So the, in the sample, uh, at the end, we had uh, movements dealing with socioeconomic issues, mostly with housing issues, home evictions, etc., uh, environmental movements, and uh, movements focused on women's rights and LGBTQ uh, rights. So uh, this was in the sample. The idea was to, uh, to first to, to, to conduct focus groups uh, with these movements, so two movements per country, but to have two focus groups per movement and to actually have focus groups with core members and focus groups with what we called followers or active citizens. That had some difficulties, as you can imagine, because most of these movements perceive themselves as horizontal and non-hierarchical. But at the end, it wasn't really easy to identify core members. And we also had some criteria how to define core members. So not, on, not those who are leaders or those who are most important, but those who are maybe most visible in public space, those uh, uh, who appear more on, uh, in, in public, etc. those who were among the initiators of the movements, etc. So we wanted to see differences in the opinions between core members and those who are followers or supporters uh, uh, of the movements. So in total, we had four focus groups in each country, uh, two focus groups uh, with, with two movements, right? It's not so complicated. And the whole research methodology involved conducting an interview with uh, one selected uh, core member. So each team had to approach one core member of the movement to conduct a basic interview with, uh, to obtain the basic information about the movement. Then uh, using snowball technique, he would provide contacts with other core members. They would provide contacts with, with followers. And that's how we, uh, how re team members reached out to core members and uh, to followers and conducted these four focus groups. There was a variety of issues that we were interested in when conducting our focus groups with them. Of course, they, uh, the, m m uh, the heaviest accent was on trust and distrust because that's the topic of the, the whole project. But we also wanted to investigate, so we we researched uh, how, what, what is the trust relations within the movements. What is the perception with the, the social movement activists? How how they trust or distrust citizens? Whether they trust distrust experts? How they involve experts in their decision making processes? Also, what are their perceptions about uh, democracies? What can be done to improve democratic states, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But the the reason the, the segment that we want to focus today. Uh, was the, the, the segment that focused on their internal organizations. So, for example, we had questions uh, that uh, uh, wanted to extract perception of the movement of its horizontal hierarchical relations. So the questions um, we asked were, for example, what are the main goals of your movement? How are they set? In what kind of process? How do you agree among yourselves about that? How would you describe the structure of your movement? How many people are engaged? Does the movement grow? How? Uh, are all welcome? Uh, what, what are the procedures for newcomers? Then how do you initiate your actions? Uh, can anyone initiate action? Is it a democratic process at all? What happens if there is disagreement among members? So we wanted to test, we wanted to, to understand, to gain insight into their internal democratic procedures and into their organizational procedures. And we also had a set of questions aiming at their understanding of democracy, engagement, the change, so how they perceive uh, democracy and how what they deem uh, necessary for democracy to work better on local level, national level, uh, and on, on EU level. So we wanted also to see their perceptions and their ideas about uh, what can be done to improve democratic uh, procedures. And I will stop here, and Gazella will continue Thanks, with some Yana, research for, results. For this. No, 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 I will understand. Oh, it's, it's, uh, uh, well, Yellen explained briefly what is what is the context of our research, and basically, uh, those who were here uh, on the first day after the session, you could see what are the major conclusions on the European level, and most of them also apply to Serbian case. And I will just uh, before I start with the, uh, I will try to be brief because we are in the end of the session. So uh, it is important for you to understand, for those who are not familiar with the Serbian context, uh, to understand that we are living like uh, more than 30 years of non-democratic uh, uh, 
system uh, with small breaks. So after 2000, we had like a decade of uh, attempt to uh, develop democratic institutions. Uh, didn't end well. Uh, we had uh, uh, elected government in 2012 uh, to punish democratic uh, forces because they were not successful enough in the process of democratic transition, economic transition, mostly with a lot of corruption, etc., etc., what you can imagine. And we, uh, we are stuck with the neoliberal, populist, uh, authoritarian government, which brought us to very the lowest level of uh, uh, democratic indicators for a longer period of time. I think from the Milosevic until today, I, I cannot claim now, I didn't uh, check, but it's very, we are in the very bad position. So uh, this is something for you uh, uh, that is important to understand. And also it is important to understand that Serbia, unlike other countries in Western Balkans, that is specificity, I would say, uh, doesn't have a strong oppositional uh, force, strong oppositional party. So the only party which was like a pillar of opposition during the 90s, a democratic party was uh, scattered or uh, torn apart by internal uh, struggles for power, for uh, uh, for, for power, yes. <laughs> uh, so this this was uh, this uh, this had really uh, incremental effect on the political life in Serbia because for the moment, uh, okay, for the moment there are some <laughs> some forces appearing to be alive and with potential to grow. But so far, basically, we were stuck with a huge support, and uh, that support, uh, it's even bigger than it was support for Communist Party in Socialist Yugoslavia, which was one party system, I can remind, remind you, because it was around uh, 700,000 members of uh, Serbian Progressive Party, which is uh, almost, uh, I think, uh, over 10%, because our population is uh, less than 6 million people. So it is really uh, kept capturing all parts, not only institutions, but only also capturing the, the political and uh, uh, social life in Serbia. In this context, uh, there were some protests emerging after these famous protests in 2000 when Milosevic was brought down. So we had a protest, some student protests, which I didn't mention here, but uh, uh, the major protests were protests against this dictatorship in 2017 and one out of a million protests in 2018-2019. Uh, they lasted for a long period of time. They were uh, organized uh, each Saturday, if I remember. One, yes, one out of uh, each Saturday. And uh, the, the, the perception from a side is that they were completely ignored by the political elite in power. So they were just left to be uh, to, to, uh, to, die. to die, yes. They were just left to die from themselves. Uh, in 2020, uh, we had, like everybody else, we had a uh, emerg state of emergency due to COVID uh, in the beginning of the, in the middle of March. And uh, uh, those measures were uh, canceled almost all in May because we were, uh, we were having elections in June. And after elections, again, they wanted to introduce uh, severe measures, and it was really uh, visible that uh, this break was done in order to have proper election campaign. So uh, when they tried to introduce these new measures, there was really a lot of people coming out to the street and protesting, and they, that came out to be really violent because reaction this time was really violent with police brutality, beating up uh, uh, even younger representatives there. So th that, that was something which was, uh, which was, uh, uh, which happened. But also this is something which is uh, the characteristic of this government. When they face uh, resistance, they withdraw. So you cannot really, there is no, uh, continuity in resistance because they make you, they give you something in order to, to, to shut you up. Uh, so today there are like three streams of the movement which are the most active in Serbia. These are urban commons which started with uh, the movement Do Not Drown Belgrade and uh, uh, which is now part of the Moramo coalition which started around these buildings which you see here uh, that were built completely illegally or to be very formally correct, they were built because the parliament, which is fully controlled, 
uh, brought the law that this is legal, which was illegal before. So this is how they did it. Uh, there is environmental movement, uh, a lot of smaller, but one bigger, which we included into this uh, sample, uh, mostly around the building small hydropower plants uh, throughout the Serbia, and recently around uh, resisting Rio Tinto and uh, mine of um, uh, lithium. Uh, and also socioeconomic movements, uh, the one which we included, uh, you, you had a chance to meet here for, for the panel where we presented the results of the project, uh, roof uh, over our heads, but there are also several other movements. Sara, who led you yesterday through the activist tour, is one of the founders and the members of Solidarity Kitchen, for example. So there are various movements who are trying to help workers, trying to help those who are in disadvantaged position, etc. When, as I will not repeat this because Yelena already said a lot about it, so we had these two movements, one environmental and another one who is dealing with socioeconomic issues or with, with evictions, uh, more specifically housing rights. And uh, what we wanted to, to, to investigate and what we wanted to show here is actually how they see their structure and how they see the decision-making process, internal structure. And they both see it as a formally horizontal movement, horizontal structure. There is a difference between those two because uh, a roof over our head uh, uh, reflects a lot on their structure and how they function as organization. While uh, uh, defending rivers, they, they don't reflect and they, it's more a little bit more chaotic and they describe it that the structure is uh, in uh, emerging now because they are becoming mass movement and this is something which is work in progress. Uh, you, you see these two quotes from the both of the, of the organizations which are actually uh, uh, explaining of, uh, how they see their, their structure. What was interesting for us to observe is that uh, unlike uh, the roof of our head, uh, defending uh, rivers uh, has a leader, they have a leader. So, or we perceive in the public space leaders of this movement and when they were asked about this, they said that they are aware of it, but they, they do not problematize it. So for them, this is not something incompatible with uh, being horizontal movement when asked, but in reality they are not problematizing it and uh, I will come later to, to why, this is the, why this is the issue with, that we need to tackle more. Uh, for them, uh, the process of decision making is a process within core member groups. So they have 20 members uh, of this core group and they all decide on the issues which are important for the moment, which is very similar to this other moment. Uh, which is deciding within this core group because usually their type of work and their engagement is usually um, very urgent. So uh, there is eviction which is happening and when they get information they need to react immediately uh, to it. So it's very difficult from their point of view to include more people, also whom to include. They include those who are frequently with them. Those core group members are those who are frequently engaged and who invest their time into, into, this, uh, into this. And also what is important to emphasize here, unlike uh, defending rivers which emerge bottom up from the people who really defended rivers on the spot, uh, this group uh, emerged from the association of different groups, so of different smaller movements who actually uh, made the coalition in order to defend people who were evicted from their homes. So there was initially there was uh, horizontality in not imposed, but uh, embedded in the structure because they started as a, a group of the groups and they needed somehow to balance this uh, organization among themselves and they kept this structure and horizontality and decision-making process even when they stopped being group of the groups but group of the people. Uh, also, it is important to mention that here uh, they, uh, they react a lot uh, on the appeals of affected community and they also try to include them into the movement. And uh, I remember the sentence, they are very disappointed that those who are victims of this, 
not really, they are not really uh, staying within the movement. So for them, this was a little bit disappointing, although they understand, they rationalize it, because those are people who are poor, who do not have time, they have to work, many jobs, etc., etc. But still, there is a feeling that they should engage more if they are victims of such, such uh, behavior from the, from the state. Uh, and this is the, one of the photos from the protest. That is how it looks like basically when there is eviction, they invite through the social media everybody to join. And usually it's like uh, 20 to 50 people who, who comes there. Uh, when it comes to membership, both say that they are inclusive, so they are open to everyone, but still there is, when you discuss it further, uh, there is something which is like uh, uh, the, the indicator or the, the, the barrier which, when it comes to really fully including people, which is understandable. Uh, that is the issue of trust, which we actually explored a lot. So uh, somebody has to prove themselves that they are uh, uh, worth being members in a way. Maybe worth is not... Uh, good word here, but I think you understand what I say. So the, the, uh, the, 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 what they observe is merit, so who engage the most, who invest their time most, who has the time also to invest the most. Maybe somebody else would be there, but they do not have enough time. But this is something, so who is there for them? That is uh, the crucial thing. Uh, and also for uh, defending rivers, that is something very much uh, they are open because this is the open process when, you know, when they invite for defending of the rivers, uh, there is a lot of people coming there, but somehow they feel that they want to keep in the core group only those who are also engaged, but who share same values and uh, they have built interpersonal trust with them. This with values is interesting and I will come back uh, to it. Uh, basically, what are the tensions within the movement? And this is something generally uh, discussed about uh, organizations, about institutions, etc. So there is always a tension between efficiency and horizontality. Uh, if you want to be efficient and do things right now, you have to act fast, then horizontality is the one who usually suffers. And there is a struggle within uh, this movement uh, uh, roof over our head to keep both in place. So this is something which they try to keep uh, within the moment. And this, there is a challenge when the moment wants to grow. So they say they would like to be more mass moment, so to engage much more people, but they didn't manage still to do that. And even if they manage to do that, then the challenge is actually how to build your, how to structure your movement, organization, in order to keep this horizontality which they em emphasize is important. If you have 20 people, that is not the same like having 200 people. So in some cases, there is division of roles, there is like subgroups, there is a central uh, group who is coordinating. So there is some kind of uh, horizontal structuring which is happening and which can in, in, from, uh, in time bring hierarchy. Uh, what is also important is uh, well, political culture and organizational culture in Serbia. Serbia is authoritarian country, it's patriarchal country, and the values of horizontality are really uh, something uh, which you need to be intentionally uh, nurturing. So these movements, the uh, roof of our head, they are aware, they are ideologically accepting this value. This is part of their beliefs that horizontality is important part of democratic processes and they try to keep it as much as possible in the whole challenging processes of uh, running organization. When it comes to defending rivers, this is very diverse group. So this is a group which where somebody can say there is a lot of right-wing uh, people, there is, uh, th those are people who and that's why I say the role of politics. Those are people who still are uh, falling for this, what uh, a majority of Serbian citizens think that politics is something dirty and to be, you know, we are not dealing with politics. We are defending rivers. We are fighting for the uh, clean air, the, the clean soil, but still this is not the politics. And this is something which when they defend themselves and then they are uh, maintaining some, uh, some let's say, uh, behavior practices which are usual for Serbian environment. 
Unlike roof over our head, they emerge from left wing, or, well, left -wing uh, organizations, groups, and they have very clear in their mind that politics is everything which they do, and they need to travel with the politics. They need their their uh, work is political. So this is the difference between these two groups. And uh, the future of their work is something which would be really interesting to observe for us because. Uh, uh, this kind of horizontality which they promote, they see it as uh, from themselves as a good practice example. So they see themselves as a good practice example for uh, functioning of other kind of organization and also of institutions. So people can, uh, I will just show the, the, the quote from one of them, people don't know how to do horizontal decision making and how to practice within horizontal organization. They are not equipped enough. The education is not equipping them to do that. So there is a lot of structural preconditions which are necessary in order to build uh, awareness about the importance of horizontality and then in their minds also importance of uh, keeping democracy which will be truly participatory. So this, this is the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gazella and Yelena. We were at, at the beginning, like 15 minutes. Uh, we started. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we have time uh, for. I will collect uh, some questions and uh, use these 15 minutes for. Okay, we have um, in the end one question uh, and yeah, one, two, three, four questions. Last, last row. Thank you. Uh, this, the question is mainly for uh, the colleagues of the last presentation, but it can be valuable also for others. Uh, um, which uh, dimension of uh, intervention there is also in your analysis that maybe in the future, for example, can be useful for the movements you, you, you analyze uh, to try to understand uh, how being part uh, of, for example, um, uh, institutional participatory experiences like could be citizen assemblies or forum or participatory budgeting could be an element uh, of tension for an internal democratization because uh, w w what I got in many years studying uh, institutional process of participation is that they have an effect, uh, a return on onto the, the, the movements because uh, uh, they put tension in their uh, monopoly of representation of the negotiation with the state because they put other, other type of citizen less organized also in touch directly with the institutions and so they, they, they create a feedback somehow. So I, I was wondering if in this research there could be a part also that exposed them to experiences of this type in other countries uh, and that they, they can learn with them that their transformation is also uh, uh, interdynamic with what they do in the territories where they work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a few questions. First, uh, I just wanted to say this was a really exciting panel. Um, I'll start with a question for Boyan uh, on these uh, trajectories of political becoming, bonding, embodying. Um, how stable are these trajectories? Uh, in other words, can we see these trajectories as reversible? Uh, and especially regarding the differences between group level and individual level trajectories, because I think these are two very different things. Um, for Boyan and Salome, uh, one question that really relates to both of your presentations, because you both actually talk about cases of strategic adaptation of movements uh, and their change in strategy in order to include broader uh, population beyond you know, the single issue and the usual people they mobilize. Um, what is the role of strategic learning in these processes? Uh, and what is this kind of role of long-term processes of learning 
uh, is different to these short-term opportunity openings that also Salome explicitly mentioned in the presentation. Uh, can you maybe just generally reflect on these two sources of, of change? Um, then for uh, Gazela, Yelena and Irena, really uh, I think this is very important uh, and very timely uh, kind of uh, work. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is that power by individuals is accumulated in a way by uh, merit and time investment. Is this maybe a risky uh, thing in the sense that uh, if those who are involved uh, are the only ones who have uh, influence, how can we expect them to keep open and deliberative atmosphere within an organization if the outsiders are discredited because they don't invest a lot of time and energy? Uh, and just a very brief point for Nathan regarding uh, his case. I understand your case of Metelkova is primarily an illustration, but I thought maybe it would be interesting to include the case of autonomous factory dog in the sense of, because this is actually a response, I would say, in Ljubljana context to the issue of uh, these heterotopic struggles. Thanks. Uh, we have Florian here and uh, anyone else? And Thanks. My question was mostly for Boyan. I mean, about this uh, terminology, the, the movement used of, of calling itself not civic, but whatever you call I don't know how you translate it to English, this, this uh, linguistic twist. And I was just kind of maybe you can say a few more words about this because. It, it, I mean, I guess, I gather it's this, that the word civic has been discredited because it's been used in a particular way. And, um, and that, I think, reflects a larger question. So, so how did that terminology evolve? And also, is there a space for this, a, a new way to understand civic when civic has been co-opted actually in a national struggle as civic meaning a particular narrow understanding of civic? So. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, I think, for the first and the last panelist, uh, just initially to follow up on your interest in how apolitical movements become political. Uh, I think it's an important question because it has to do with mechanisms that uh, deal with, I think, two primar primary goals of any movement, which is first to be heard and second to succeed. But autocratic and authoritarian governments have ways of making you be heard, but uh, making you not succeed. And this is something that was touched upon in the last uh, talk. So uh, what could be some of the ways in which these new, newly political movements can protect themselves against such, a, such an effect? Okay. Thank you. On Giovanni's question, so if I understood correctly, is that would participation of these movements members in the Liberty Forum, like Citizens Assembly, would that help them improve their internal democratic practices? Uh, theoretically, yeah, it sounds like that would be the right thing to do. We know that in some movements here and also others in, in the region, we had uh, activists who did participate in some kind of, of, they were part of some kind of actions. And, but these are, this, this is the question whether individual experiences and the experience of individuals can, can scale up on the, on the experience of the whole movement and how, how this process of, of delivering you know, this spillover effect, that is it effective or not, and how, how that can help others also get in, involved. I don't know, I don't have an answer to that question because it's, it's purely theoretical one, it's a speculative one, but I would say that yes, the exposure to these experiences would probably be very, very important, but then again, we have the problem of context, you know, you have to, you have to implement, so your experiences, you have to root them back in your, in your surroundings, in your context, which is not very, very favorable, and I think that the challenges will remain the same, challenges of efficiency versus horizontality, right? So these challenges remain the same, but I would say that any kind of experience of getting together and being involved in these kind of things is helpful. So definitely. And, and yeah. techniques. Yes, techniques yes, are, yes, yes, exactly. That's true, that's true, yes. I think that, that that would be probably the most beneficial thing because many of these movements are inexperienced. They're not aware of the different techniques that can, that can be really helpful in overcoming these obstacles. So yes, absolutely yes. Uh, the second question was uh, merit infrastructure, uh, right? That, that, yeah, that's that's always that's always the, the questions in in other other movements that nurture kind of democratic 
uh, discussion and that horizontality. They had those that, even if, even if they say we're not merit-based, we're not going to be merit-based, but the, the fact is that some members and some individuals will be present more, will be able to devote more time just because they are either single or don't have kids or, I don't know, don't have any other obligations or whatever, and other who, who are not in such a position will not be able to. And then there's a question of, okay, so do our voices, I mean, our voices equal? Should we be equal in decision? It's, it's a real, I think that it's thing that has to be negotiated all the time. And I think that needs to be openly discussed, that movements need to discuss these issues because there are various ways of contributing to the movement. It's not only de devoting your time and resources, but it's also, you, you can devote uh, less amount of time but still have substantial contribution to the movement. And I think that it's just only through open process and through constant discussion of the thing that, that you, can, you can overcome uh, these issues. Uh, and uh, uh, also there was this question of, uh, how can this, uh, please, uh, re uh, you, you had a question for Boyan and for us, just please, if you can repeat it. Just that a lot of different uh, mechanisms for organizations to participate, trying to get some message across can uh, stop uh, or prevent autocratic governments or authoritarian governments from uh, infiltrating, so to say, into their goals. Or from, from co-opting, like like how to be resilient from, from co-opting. Um, yeah. I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I would just say that each movement learns from the lessons of the previous one. I think that also also it's a process. I think that these kind of the, these real movements are something new for the region, and I think that it was when it started with I would say with student protests in 2010. Croatia or something like that. I, I don't know. That these, these new kind of movements started to emerge in this, this part of the region. I would say that then, uh, then the, the, the methods of, of cooptation are something that you learn, and then you learn how to, to overcome that. But also, I would say that you know we had in the region these alliances between movements and CSOs, like we had in North Macedonia. Uh, we heard Nanette talking about that the first uh, night. And we also have this party movement thing, that the movements are becoming parties and entering the electoral arena and also gaining new... So this is, these are all new things and we will see whether they uh, we, will show resilience or whether they will uh, become part of the problem. You know, there's also a possibility. I mean, the problem is uh, uh, what we faced in Macedonia and what we're facing here uh, the, the, and what uh, actually Janina said, uh, don't ask for more participation because that's not really something which is uh, uh, feasible or it's not going to happen. The problem is that you have the limited pool of the people, you know, and it's uh, your, in the end, I think uh, if you want to make your party movement massive, in the end you will have to make some concessions except some people who are already politically active and who can help you. And not only because of the reason that there is limited pool of people, also because sometimes those people ha have a knowledge, expertise about internal uh, functioning of institutions which uh, new movements, especially these bottom-up movements, often uh, lack. And that is something, you know, uh, between educating them how to do that, which is the most efficiently done through the practice, and preparing them, you know, uh, and just putting them in the fire, you know, there has to be some balance and there has to be some support. And this is like maybe the, the, the compromise which you sometimes need to, to make in order to grow. Uh, thank you for this question. So I'm going to start with uh, Carlos. How stable are these trajectories? Uh, they're not stable. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I call them like the trajectories and not types or anything, it's just, uh, I was like, these are the three I identified. Like this does not exhaust the possibility of other trajectories of kind of political subjectification. The, the thing is, uh, uh, like, I was only interested in the fact that they started to do something in one way and then they ended up being political in this way or another. The other thing on individual level where it's important that most of these activists kind of continued to be activists or be politicians. Some of my responders are, since respondents are now mayors or whatever, or some of them were at that time kind of more class oriented and uh, in recent years kind of became kind of prominent nationalists. Things change, you know, like 
on both sides. So in terms of role of strategic adaptation and learning, for example, in the case of Berancelo, and I was writing that in a, another paper, much of their uh, success uh, was unintended consequences, and they were clear about that. Like, their goal was to put an end uh, to, 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 you know, like waste disposal in their village. However, after two years, they realized, oh, we became this big thing. You know, like, but then there was also kind of the way they learned, uh, uh, the, the kind of, they became emancipated, like, most of their activists are kind of conservative, traditionalist, uh, elderly folk, but there was, for example, which was in Montenegro problematic, kind of, uh, uh, to support, like, LGBT population, so for them it was like uh, members of certain LGBT organization came to support them, and Jovan was telling me it was now their time to support like LGBT, uh, some, some activism and pride. So for them, it was like, okay, sh they, they showed us support. Now we have to be the key support for the LGBT protest. So in their kind of system, uh, like their moral system, you know, like they showed support, like they don't understand it. They maybe not support it politically, but they were there for them. So it went both ways and of course, during that process, things uh, uh, changed. What Florian asked, I mean, it's interesting, like, uh, for me, uh, uh, I mean, in Serbia, it's kind of Grajanisti and everything, it's kind of pretty common, and I've seen, like, uh, uh, now the new term in which supported discourse is auto chauvinisti, etc., etc. In Montenegro, uh, Grajanisti is very different. For me, I was always defining Mon Montenegrin citizenism, gradualism is Montenegrin nationalism that refuses to be self-perceived as nationalism. So in Montenegro, the formula for civicness is Montenegrins plus ethnic minorities minus Serbs or political Serbs, you know, like. So uh, uh, the, the evolution of term, it really became a, now a, 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 a problem. It, it became kind of symbolically polluted for because many of the nationalists see that they are, or even serve that they are looked uh, down, uh, you know, like they're being belittled by uh, by Grajanisti. So this movement was, I mean, they, they created this uh, temporary kind of political bond, nothing more than that. Things returned uh, to, to normal. You know, so, uh, uh, but it's interesting that this was the, the first uh, uh, kind of intentional and conscious attempt to challenge the, 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 the mainstream definition or to challenge this binary that goes nationalists, uh, 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 and, uh, ethnic, civic, uh, grajani, grajanisti, etc., etc. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting how it's going to develop now that things have changed in Montenegro, but uh, the, this, this term is, it's, it's still problematic. Now it's Grajani. <laughs> and uh, uh, being heard and being successful, I mean, depends, you know, like I try to look at the success of a m movement in the ways they, they are defining it. I really don't try to impose like what I see as a success. So, uh, in Montenegro is they're very specific, you know, like, you, n it's very hard to kind of co-opt a movement or to infiltrate it because everybody knows everybody, <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's really, really, really hard to do it. But the important thing was, you know, like, they brought politics into, like, Gazella was saying, uh, many of these movements before them really didn't want to do anything with politics. Like, politics is a dirty word, and uh, that's for corrupt politicians. The things we are doing is out of self-interest or some moral principles, etc. No, this was kind of really, really political movement. So, you know, like, sometimes being heard is, you know, like, enough at certain points. So. Thank you for your question. Um, so the question was, as I remember, about uh, the changing of strategy and uh, what was the sh uh, short-term and long-term results. What about the changing the strategy? 
Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, we have a lot of protests, meetings, we, and experience. We have a great experience in protesting uh, quite everything from the Soviet period, from the Gorbachev period too. But uh, quite all of these protests were political protests against the uh, um, government, then against the uh, Saakashvili government, now uh, against uh, it's never dreams government and so and so or against Russia or against the invasion in Ukraine, uh, Russia and so and so. Uh, uh, the Gudiashvili Square case was the first uh, case where it was absolutely political. Uh, and um, uh, Tiflisi Hamkari, they recognized that the political, uh, a political uh, movement could not uh, gather a lot of people uh, around them. Uh, and there could not be the shouting of uh, go home, such, for example, Saakashvili or uh, Ioannishvili and so. They could not uh, shouting Gaumarjo's long live in Georgia, it lives and quite in all demonstrations we have uh, shouting Gaumarjo's someone or Gaumarjo's somebody or so and so. So they decided to change this uh, repertoire, to change this strategy. Uh, and they recognize that uh, the urban movement for uh, defending uh, cultural heritage uh, could not uh, gather a lot of people. And they, uh, one of the respondents told me that we were aware that um, maybe at this um, um, activities we were included thousand people, nearly thousand people, and it, it was not. It was so uh, in Wake Park and in uh, uh, defend Gudiashvili or say Gudiashvili square there were not a, a crowd of people but uh, uh, these uh, movements were uh, were successive in any case so uh, this is why they decided to change the strategy uh, not shouting on not demonstrating but absolutely positive uh, and what about the uh, short term and the long term results short term results if it is uh, short term that uh, this square is rehabilitated and uh, it's one of the uh, very finest uh, places now in old Tbilisi and uh, it is like in 19th century maybe. Uh, and what about the long term? As one of the main organizers of this uh, protest told me, uh, the most uh, impressive result uh, of Kudiashvili Square was that after that moment, uh, the study uh, and uh, to defend the issue of defending cultural heritage in Tbilisi and urban uh, fabric became popular and uh, people recognized that they have to defend cultural heritage in their own space, in their uh, own towns and uh, own cities. So it's the most uh, long-term um, result of this movement uh, I can define. So. Yeah, I can only say that I, I completely agree with your comment, Carlo, and uh, that is one of the limitations of this data set, that it doesn't really span over all, which is of course now evicted and a bit more difficult to study. But I, I think in order to develop this idea in, in relation to the context of Ljubljana, I would have to pay much more attention to Rog than I'm doing in this paper. So yes. Thank you so much for this great panel. And just yeah. Uh, let's have a coffee break until 12.15 and then we are going to have Cornelia here to present us a little bit more on uh, tools of participatory democracy which Council of Europe has developed. Thank you. Thank you.